So I thought part there today and talk about food allergies versus intolerance versus sensitivity. Will you just help us get get grounded in this concept, get on the same page and tell us kind of the general definitions and differences between these conditions? So that I think this is probably one of the most common things we talk about in the office because it is so confusing to families. Yeah. So let's start with food allergies because that's probably the one thing that most people can understand the easiest. So those are typically IgE mediated. Usually those symptoms are fairly acute. So patients will have difficulty breathing, hives, rashes, maybe lip swelling. They're the ones that are going to most likely cause anaphylaxis. And the ones that if you do go to the allergist, you're going to be most likely to have positive skin prick testing, need to have an epinephrine pen. Now, there are two non-IgE-mediated food allergies in pediatric patients, which I think is probably very interesting and not well known by the wider community. So they're typical in infants, and one is called food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, and the other one is called Food, these are, if you want to talk about complicated names, food protein proctocolitis. So that's typically a baby that's having bloody stools or the other syndrome is usually a baby that's having a lot of vomiting. So there are a few non-IgE mediated problems in babies, but across the lifespan, the IgE ones are going to be more acute and you can go to the allergist to sort of sort that through. Now food intolerances, that is a huge category of food reaction. So that can be a reaction to something in the food like a dye, a chemical, a reaction to caffeine. It could also be a problem with sugar digestion. So lactose intolerance is a very common food intolerance. Or there's one that we see a lot in pediatrics actually called the sucrose isomaltase deficiency. And that's, believe it or not, that's an inability to digest sugar, like table sugar. And that can cause a lot of symptoms for children. And then the last big category where probably most people think end up being in is like the food sensitivity category. So these are patients that are having some type of immune reaction to the food and they can have GI symptoms and non-GI symptoms. And I'm sure we'll get into all the different details of that later in, in the talk. And they, the difficulty with that is that we don't have as well validated testing, I think, in pediatrics, as we do for the other two types of food reactions. So, Well, thank you for giving us some clarity. I, I just knew you probably get this question in the office all the time and from colleagues. The mom part of my brain knows that other moms are listening and they want to know, are, are these things I'm going to notice when I have an infant or is it appearing, you know, in early childhood, when do I start to see the signs that my kiddo is not doing well with a food? So that actually, that you you can see it any time across the lifespan. And so the reactions are very age dependent. So a baby may have severe vomiting or poor weight gain or blood in the stool, whereas older children may develop food aversions and just have abdominal pain or diarrhea or the teenager, especially if they have something like eosinophilic esophagitis, may have difficulty sleeping. And then sometimes the families are going to see non-GI symptoms too. So definitely there are things like hyperactivity, brain fog, rashes, moodiness, those type of things that families start to often question, you know, is this is this food related? So There's no one real answer to that, but really, you know, a lot of foods can cause a lot of different symptoms and they do change over the, uh, over the lifespan. Mm -hmm. Sounds like just being diligent and kind of monitoring, is my child acting normally, responding normally and raising the red flag when anything abnormal happens? But are there, we always talk about, you know, pattern recognition in functional medicine. Are there any signs that we can look for from someone's environment or their family history or other immune conditions that they have that might tell us about their general risk for developing some type of food reaction? So that's a, that's a great question. And you can actually, sometimes when we take the history in clinic, just by taking the history, I almost feel like I know what the child is going to have. Yeah. So celiac disease, I think is a very obvious example. So if there's a first degree relative with celiac disease. So if your mom or dad has celiac disease, then you have about a 30% chance of also having celiac disease. Other things that are non-celiacs, so more like 
protein intolerances, food sensitivities, infants who are reacting. If a mom had a C-section or if the mom didn't breastfeed, antibiotics have been shown over and over again to be like triggers for bait children later on developing food allergies because of the effects they cause to the, to the microbiome. I think there's a little bit of data on pollution. Depending on your background, your, your race, whether you're African-American or Caucasian or Hispanic, you're going to have a more likelihood to have maybe lactose intolerance or specific types of food allergies. So yeah, there's, a, there's actually a lot in the history that can kind of point you towards thinking of food as a trigger for the patient's symptoms. I can see now how using a functional medicine model with our timeline and our focus on the antecedents, triggers, and mediators could really help you collect a lot of information about what might be contributing to this patient's symptoms, yeah? Yeah, and then actually sometimes patients, we as we go through the evaluation and the workup and we come to the final diagnosis and then we go back and look as a group uh-huh. and we are all able to sort of identify that trigger, whether it was an infection or the antibiotics from the ear, and you know, from the recurrent ear infections, or then just the family's genetic history. It can be very cathartic for the families. Like they're, they're like almost relieved. So I, do, as a parent, we have an abnormal amount of guilt. We, we like, whenever our child is sick, we somehow like blame ourselves and maybe we're not nurturing them properly or giving them the right food or giving them the right behavioral structure. And so when families are able to kind of realize what the triggers were, and maybe they were triggers that are out of their control, it actually takes a lot of that pressure off the family, a lot of the guilt that, you know, they're here to make their child better, but they're not the cause. It's a very irrational guilt, but it's, it's as a parent, it's really hard to, to sometimes get it out of your head that it's not your fault that your child is sick. Yeah, yeah. Deeply felt as, as a parent. Yeah. 